Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvelously well. I'm sitting here with the wonderful Mr. Michael Beinhorn. How are you? I'm great, thanks. How are you? I'm really good. I'm excited to have our conversation because last time we were sitting here talking, I think it was off camera, maybe it was a little bit on camera, I'd asked you what you were presently working on, you told me about the artists you're working on, and that you were doing pre-production with them. And actually, you know, I was just telling you I was in Nashville yesterday, wow. <laughs> I was in Nashville yesterday, and I was hanging out with Reed Shippen, who I'm sure everybody knows, an amazing oh, uh, yeah. engineer and incredible mixer in his own right. And he was telling me, you know, a fondness for your records. And the reason why we both love the records is when you listen to a Michael Bonehorn production, sorry to blow smoke and all this kind of stuff, it just feels like it covers all the bases. There's so many producers that I love that I can hear their sonic imprint. There's many producers I love where I can hear, I'll be overly simplistic, I know who did it. When I listen to the producers like you, John Leckie's another favorite of mine. Mm. Yeah. They sound like the band. Like I don't, if, if there's anything that you and John Leckie have in common is the fact that you make like the band's record that sounds most like the band. Does that sound, does that make sense to everybody? <laughs> um, so. Well, it could be. So my conclusion is, is and, I've, and from me talking to you, I can guarantee that I'm, I'm right in this conclusion is that you're, you're in every single detail. You give a crap about everything. Yeah, so. yeah. Like, I guess you don't have to be if you don't want to be, but I certainly feel like I got to be. Right. It's kind of a sacred trust in a way. Like, it's my responsibility. I figure if someone's paying me enough money to do this and they've given, they've entrusted me with their work, like, why wouldn't I put everything I have into it? You know, but it also heightens their expectation as well of what they're doing. Like, I expect that much of myself. Hopefully, they're expecting that much of themselves as well. You know, us working together winds up being a true collaboration on that level. And to me, I, that's the only way I can do it. That's absolutely the only way I can do it. I, I think the only, when I, have you ever seen the, the Kubrick? I think we talked about this Kubrick documentary. It's like the definitive one. It's like a two-hour <laughs> one just on his life and everything. I've seen that. Do you feel like, because I'm getting right to the, cut into the chase here before we even get into pre-production stuff. Um, oh. What I love about that Kubrick documentary is you could tell that when he worked on the movie, it was like a massive portion of his life. And it was like, it was so absorbing. Uh, what's the word? Immersive. So immersive. Thank you. That like at the end of it, he was just done and he moved on to something else. And a lot of the, art, a lot of the people that were working with him were like, weren't we just best friends? It's like, no, I'm now focusing on something else. Yeah. I mean, yeah. do you feel any sort of kinship in that? Yeah, actually I do. I think, yeah, when I've worked on many projects actually, it becomes so all-encompassing and such a, just s such a massive undertaking mm -hmm. Because there's like a, yeah, to do, to, to me, to do this kind of work, like there has to be a vision. Mm -hmm. You have to sort of create a vision in your mind about what this is going to be, what it looks like. And on so many different levels as well, you know, trying to understand the artist, listening to the songs, because there's so much more to it than just sort of like this, you know, song structures and, you know, all the basics. It goes, it goes much deeper. There's the psychology, there's the individuals you know, what they represent, what it is that they're trying to say. To me, that there's just sort of like this, this grand kind of vision that gets shaped out of all that. And if I feel like it's my job to hold on to that. I'm, I, I know at any rate what I'm, what I'm visualizing is not something that I can share with anyone else because I couldn't really describe it, if that sure. makes any sense. But it's kind of like the seed of the project. One of the things I, um, when I, my old studio, um, uh, we used to do a lot of pre-production there. And a lot, and one of the, the producers that used to use the room a lot was Rick Rubin. And uh, I'd heard all the stories about Rick, I suppose, whatever, it's on camera, it's too late, you know, not really showing up to the studio very often. Mm -hmm. And I'd heard all those stories and I'd heard them from artists I've worked with who gave me first-hand experiences. But then I saw the thing that Rick did really, really well, when he did it really well, was he would just go into the room with the band 
and work on the song so much that by the time they came to record it, he probably could be relatively hands-off. He just needed a really amazing engineer like a Jim Scott to capture it. I'm not saying that's the, only, that's, that's the way to make a record. I think that's a part of it. But it did definitely highlight to me the importance of pre-production. Oh, man. And it's crazy because it's something that I feel that people have really been taking advantage of less and less. Yes. Um, over the past 15, 20 years, it's... And, and obviously, it's a, it's a budgetary consideration. As right. a producer... You know, if you're getting paid a certain amount of money, that's that takes care of the time that you're allotted to, you know, to, to make a record. Mm -hmm. And it becomes prohibitive to put as much time as you normally would into making a record if you're getting paid far less than you may have been getting paid like 10, 15 years ago to do the same kind of project. And there's still even more expected of you. Like you have to record the record. You have to you know, set up mics, you may not have an assistant, you may not have your own engineer, sure. you, have to, yeah. you have to wear all these different hats. And on top of that, like, what about the songs? Well, I guess, you know, we're not going to be able to spend as much time, if, you know, beforehand, we can do some changes in the studio prior to sure. recording, like while we're there, while we're setting up, could you play that again? Right. You know, why didn't you change that little bit? But if you think about it from the standpoint of making a movie, I can't imagine anyone ever going in to make a movie without some kind of prep work. Yep, yep. It's, it, it just wouldn't happen. You wouldn't be able to get money to do it. But people seem to feel that because this is music, that it's, oh, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. They're just songs anyway. And I think it kind of like speaks to how people sort of devalue music in the culture now, how less important it is, now, it seems to be now to people. Sure. Which is, you know, which, which is extremely unfortunate. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that, like, when people go back and say things like, oh, you know, well, you know, it's a rock band. You just go in and record it and knock it out. It's like, well, first of all, people don't play like that anymore. Mm -hmm. Second of all, um, you know, you don't have people like who, who are like a Muddy Waters or something like that who could just plug into an amp, sit down, play a song, you know, for like two and a half, three minutes and make something iconic. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. You know, there are no artists like the Rolling Stones, even the Rolling Stones themselves, sure. who, <laughs> who can make records like that where they'll just kind of like knock out a jam or something like that and it'll be like, it'll be earth shattering. Yep. You know, so there has to be some degree of time and effort that gets put into hashing people's music out. At least that's my perspective on it. And that, that, that perspective has been borne out quite a bit over time. I've seen it work over and over again, you know, for decades, you know. I can see this on so many levels because there's the obvious basic level of just getting in a room and rehearsing and getting the band tight enough to start recording. That saves you the get into a room and just edit the drums tight and then over, you know, it, it preserves groove and it preserves feel and it and, and adds groove and adds feel oh, most man. importantly. Uh, yeah. you're, go <laughs> you're going into, into all kinds of different territories with yeah. this. I mean, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. No, but no, like, please. No, but, but it's, it's crazy how people think that they can actually compensate for what they don't have at the beginning point, mm -hmm. somewhere in the middle or even at the end point. Like, we'll fix it here, we'll fix it there. As opposed to, we should go into a rehearsal room, like you're saying, and just work on this until it feels right and sounds right. Yeah, that's amazing. So that seems like a very somewhat obvious thing for a band to do, let alone, you know, working on the songs before they even go and rehearse them. Mm -hmm. You know, making sure that there's a song there to rehearse. Yeah. And, and beyond just like, you know, melody and, and harmony and, and parts, lyrics, what are you trying to say? So many levels here. It's like pulling back like a level of an onion each time. Now, obviously, there's plenty of, uh, you know, pop songs which exist on a, in, a, in a very peripheral kind of uh, fun level, which is okay, you know. I mean, Trevor Horn's one of my, I think, one of the most talented oh people in the world. God. But he wrote, you know, video, you know, video killed the radio star. It's a yeah. great Buggles pop song. And yeah. I don't know if that was a life's work or something he did in three <laughs> minutes. Either way, it was genius. Yeah. Um, so I think, and you know, we both agree that art is all kinds of levels. Sometimes it is ultra simplistic yeah. and sometimes it's the opposite. So yeah. You know. And there's, 
the, the thing is, is that there's room for all of it. Mm -hmm. There's room for trashy pop music. There's room for electronics. I mean, when people say, I don't like this kind of music, I don't like that kind of music, it's like, well, fine. You know, then you don't have to listen to it, but there's still no reason why it shouldn't exist. It, there's room for all of it. I do find, though, that when people start becoming exclusive about certain types of music, sure. almost like fa <laughs> fascistic yeah. about it in a way, like that the only types of music that are viable are the types of music that sell. And right now, obviously, that happens to be pop and, and, and hip hop. Right. You know, which, by the way, I feel that there, there absolutely is room for, and there has to be. There, there, there always will be. I'm glad that hip hop is popular music now, but at this, but because rock music has become devalued to a certain extent, I feel it's been marginalized immensely. And I mean, you can see this in the way the industry is treating it as well. Like, I mean, just look at how they how rock music is is treated in the Grammy Awards. Like now, all those those awards are given like off camera and stuff. Sure. You know, and and then you start seeing people editorializing about like rock. You know, guitar is the guitar is dead. Right. Guitar solos are dead. I mean, I've seen articles like this, and it's like, what in the world are you talking about? Right. What's dead? How and who are you to say this? Mm -hmm. You know. You're talking about this because essentially market values sure. ha are, are sort of judging right now mm -hmm. what's selling and what, and what isn't. What, what people, and that, that's based on what, what, what people are going to put resources behind. Sure. You know, like that's the basis on which we decide what music is valuable and what isn't. Right. Like um, I know eras where rock music has been fantastically lucrative. If you want to judge it, in that way. But what people aren't doing is they're not going like, okay, what is it? If we consider rock music, because obviously that's one of the forms of music where you need a band to do it and songs have to be rehearsed and written and people have to sort of labor over it. What am I trying to say? Blah, 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 blah. Like, what can we do? If, 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 it's, if there is any viability, mm -hmm. And we believe, obviously, since we're talking that there is, what is it that we're not doing? And what is it that we can do to make it more viable, to make it something that can, that, that can compete in the market again, for sure. lack of a you know, more delicate way of putting it, I suppose, or one that's closer to the, the art side of things. All right, making better records. What can sure. we do to make better records? Which is my personal take on this the, the, the thing is you came from a background um you know in new york in the late 70s and early 80s where you were fusing i, I don't know if it was pre-hip-hop but you were fusing elements that were just about to become hip-hop so you were taking the elements that were about to start this massive scene um and introducing it into rock and roll then so yeah well i mean hip-hop had actually it was kind of going Right. Before. But it just wasn't mainstream. It, it, no, it definitely wasn't mainstream, you know, but like the, like the year and a half before we did Rocket, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, was a, there, there were a lot of breakout songs mm -hmm. um, like Planet Rock. I think Buffalo Girls might have been the, the year before. Sure. Magnificent Seven by The Clash. You know, these right. were all things that were kind of like busting, that were like destroying boundaries. Okay. In a lot of ways, in bringing those music forms out into the, you know, into the um, public eye, but um, yeah, you know, we we were we were working with a lot of really interesting cultural elements before before they they came to the surface at that point. But I think what I'm sort of hinting at is like that's what always made rock great was the fact that it was able to well look its, it's beginnings are it comes from blues. So it, it's like, you know, it's taking a, almost a, what's, what's, the, what's the politically correct way of saying, culturally, I don't know, can't remember. It's basically taking another complete culture, incorporating it into, I don't know, country maybe, you know, mm -hmm. blues and country had a baby and they gave us early rock and roll. <laughs> is that an oversimplification? My well, point there is, so, is like, there, were so, there were so many different forms that came mm -hmm. down the pike. Yeah. I mean, come on, like... 
Little Richard influenced the Beatles. Sure. And, I mean, all the, all the English bands. Yeah. Gene Vincent. I yep. mean, who does John Lennon sound probably the most like? Gene Vincent. Right. Um, you know, obviously all the all the stars from like fr sure. from the blues. Jeff Beck's favorite guitar player was Cliff Gallup, Gene Vincent's guitar player. There you go. Yeah. What I'm trying to point to, and I know you know it's obvious what I'm saying, is like rock rock and roll, rock music has always incorporated other elements around it. And I think probably what's hurting it at the moment um, is the fact that it's not doing that. That it's sort of um, a lot of bands are sort of knuckling down on a genre. Getting back to your point, you know, earlier on where you were saying when when you start loving like one specific thing too much and you close your 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 ears and your eyes off to you know what is going on around you. I think that would really help it. I don't know what the secret is to be honest, because mm -hmm. I think just simply putting programmed EDM music and heavy guitars at the top is not is not exciting yeah. and different enough. I think it has to go deeper than that. We've got a lot of issues in that <laughs> regard. You know, <laughs> you you have to consider also the fact that the nascence of rock music was kind of based on having these indigenous forms of music that, that had essentially, I, I guess, generated all this greatness only a few years before. Mm -hmm. Like the music that the Beatles and the Stones were, were, were taking as like, you know, starting point for their own music. It was like seven years old, right. five years old. You know, this was all, it was relatively new. And there was still kind of, there was a track of indigenous music relative to what they were trying to do in, in, in more of a pop world that was, that, that was kind of like happening at roughly the same time. So you kind of had, the, like, th things are a little bit different now. You don't have that same kind of um, wellspring Yep. to draw from. And that's one reason why I think that rock has essentially been recycling itself now for decades. You know, it's also one reason why people keep trying to go back and make like Houses of the Holy or Led Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin for like over and over and over again. Every, you know, every decade or every generation, yeah, every decade basically, there is a new rock band or a couple that come out and start trying to like, you know, be the new Zeppelin, mm -hmm. you know, or borrow borrow those elements uh you know do you know charlie gillett he wrote a book called the sound of the city no and his argument is it's gonna it's gonna in, in, incite a lot of uh, conversation by me saying this he said that uh led Zepp, the trifecta of uh, led zeppelin black sabbath and deep purple all listened to blues and created early heavy rock then aerosmith god love them came along and listened to those bands. And then Motley Crue listened to Aerosmith and so on and so on. And the thing was, is they all missed going back to the source. They weren't creating something unique from the source. They were sort of, you know, as you were saying, they're sort of recycling themselves. Yeah, they, yeah. I, at least, at least those bands though were able to create something that had its own identity. Sure. That, de that definitely developed its own kind of like it, it, its own personality. I think that we're in danger right now of people sort of using pop music as a way to kind of like deflect who they are instead of reflect. Mm. Instead of be, instead of instead of be using it as a, as a medium of expression, which you know, as I, I know we've talked before, that's just, that's the essence of what music is. Yeah, it's, I like that. It, it, it's pure communication. It's just meant to be another mode of being able to speak to people and hopefully a way to express some aspect of who you are. Right. You know, in, in many cases, not through literal text, mm -hmm. you know, so there's always going to be some derivation. Yeah. Like perhaps the text is like a different thing, you know, and, and the music is more, is more a literal interpretation. We're really in danger of moving away from, from that. I mean, I think to a great extent we already have. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the type, if, see if I say the type of music, that means that I'm talking about a specific genre and I don't mean that at all. Sure. What I mean is music that doesn't really generate any kind of emotional response because it didn't come from an emotional response. Mm -hmm. If you're making music that kinda, that's, that's really designed to kind of to make people buy it, where it's been commoditized so much sure. that it's meant 
it's meant to be sold, you've made something that's also disposable. A consumable is something that can't last by its own, by its own design. You know, and that's essentially what music is right now. It's a consumable. Right. It's, it's designed for consumption. It's designed for something that can be seen as a stream on YouTube once, maybe twice, and then discarded and never seen again. That really, I feel, goes against the essence of what music is. Sure. You know, it can't not. So... On that note. On that note. What is your process with pre-production? What, um, I, I, obviously, I know the artists that you're, you're, I don't know if, you're, if you finished working with them, but uh, I know the artists that you were working with last time we spoke. It's and ongoing. Ongoing? Okay, yeah. good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. that, that, that I, I like the artists and I like the band. Yeah. So, and uh, as you know, one of the members is a very good friend of mine. So yes. that's, that's very exciting because I think it will be an amazing yeah. record as a result. Yeah. Um, so what's the process? Well, because people don't have recording budgets anymore, I've had to figure out how to do this so I can work with an artist for as long as possible before they go into a recording studio. So what I'm doing is essentially working almost via correspondence, which is, it's incredibly simple. Like people will send me demos and I just sit with them and listen to them, figure out exactly what's working. But more important, what isn't working and then I relay all the information back. But the song obviously has to be broken down to like subatomic level. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know. Great. You know, but where you're talking about drum beats and things like that and root notes and, you know, harmonies and, you know, guitar rhythms and mm -hmm. vocal rhythms and why melodies are working and why they're not working and, you know, why, you know, why I can't understand your lyric right here. What, did it, what is it that you're trying to say? Mm -hmm. You know, and also understanding the artist and realizing that sometimes, again, this, this music doesn't necessarily call for a literal interpretation. But yeah, breaking stuff down really to like the basics, stripping it mm -hmm. apart, building it back up and providing people with solutions. And then we wind up talking about it. There, we, wind, we wind up having, a, having conversations about it via video and... We go through several rounds of this where people will go back because nowadays, obviously, the recording technology is prevalent and everyone's got it. Yep. So it's easy to go back and re-record a demo on your own dime and on your own time. Sure. And uh, I get a new iteration. And slowly but surely, it gets dialed in. That's amazing. It's, uh, it's not really, <laughs> but thank you for saying so. I think it's amazing that any... The, the people still see the value in it. And it's common just, sense. I know, uh, unfortunately, I, I would have to agree with you, it is common sense, but unfortunately, it isn't what everybody oh, does. People don't see the value in yeah. it. They don't see the value in it at all. Even when you explain it to them, mm -hmm. so you have to show them. But when you've shown them, when they actually see not only what's there, but also what's not working, mm -hmm. and they get to see some some possible solutions for repairing the issues and they actually try them out and they go oh my gosh then they get it having the experience of what a rearranged piece of music can be when you especially when you're the writer yep. and you either have a blind spot to the music that you've written because obviously as the composer you're usually completely subjective about it you, it's very difficult to be objective about your own work which is why self-producing, again, is a terrible mistake. But also, in a lot of cases, people actually do have uncertainties about what they've written, but mm -hmm. they don't know what it is. Like, they always, like, I have people say to me all the time, like, that's so weird. I knew there was something wrong there. I just kept feeling it, but I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. And then they get it pointed out to them. And the revelation of that is one of the most wonderful and eye-opening things that you can possibly imagine. Because not only does it confirm to them what they've been thinking the whole time, but it also frees them and opens them up to a whole different way of looking at their own music. Mm. The other perspective. They can take a different perspective and they can see their music through someone else's eyes. And that is a tremendous gift. That's can't enormous, be, yeah. It can't be... You, you know what I'm talking about. I do, but yeah. That's, you know, I, I, I do, but uh, it's, that's really well articulated because it is 
really difficult to be objective about your own music. It's impossible. Yeah. It's impossible, but people are being forced to be objective about their own music now because of the economics. That's the bottom line. There's no other reason at all. Um, you know, having like a minuscule recording budget to work with and having to get like an A or even a B list producer to work with because you need someone in the studio who's got experience. Mm -hmm. These are things that like pull the money right out of the, you know, right out of the bank. And this is how people make records now. But at the same time, it means that you're, that you're cutting the entire process of making a record down from months into, in many cases, a few weeks, mm. you know? And again, it's like guys like us, we gotta live, you know? Like as a producer, like I gotta feed my family and stuff, you know, or, or maintain whatever standard of living that I have become accustomed to and would not wanna move out of, which is fine. There's no reason that anyone should have to change any of that, but there has to be a level at least in my way of thinking. There has to be some place where artists can go where they can have their work scrutinized by someone who's a trusted outsider who can provide them the objectivity that they desperately need. And that's a position that I feel needs to be filled, and that's why I've taken on this undertaking. I think it's fantastic. Well, thank you. How, well, how did you fall into this particular gig, for instance? What, 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 did somebody contact you? Did you? Were you interested in working with the artist? How did, how did this come about? Uh, the one that we were talking mm -hmm. about? Uh, I contacted someone working with them mm -hmm. and who I, I didn't know that they, I didn't know that they worked with them. And I let them know that this is what I was doing mm -hmm. and that it would be something that they would, if they didn't understand it right now, they would understand it eventually, and it would be something that they would have great need of. And fortunately, this individual realized that the artist in question had great need of it and hooked us up, and the rest, as they say, is ongoing history. Ongoing history. Yeah. Um, no, I think, I hate talking in riddles. I apologize for everybody, but it's not my place to say who the artist is. But I do know, I do have a firsthand uh, um, knowledge that's the best way of putting it. Uh, <laughs> and I know that they, they, they usually turn up with 40 songs before yeah. making a record. I, yeah. I've, heard, I've heard that number actually is probably quite low. Right. And so um, I imagine you're sifting through a lot of songs. Sometimes To narrow yes. it down. And Sometimes no. Right. I think, he's, I think he's trying to focus. I think he's trying to focus what he's doing. You know, with each artist, I mean, this is, this is such a change. Mm -hmm from going into a recording studio, like doing, doing a recording the old fashioned way, like starting from the ground up. I know, but you know, Reed and I were talking about this and when we were talking about you, it was like, you know, cause as artists we were thinking, well, Michael be the guy we would hire to do our record. Because we, you know, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. We just sort of get the impression that it was really completist, which is why I was talking about Kubrick. Like how mm. guys would say, two years of a life, boom, and then it's done, and it was just, that's it. They're like, Stanley, and he's on to something else. Yeah. And, and but every one of Stanley Kubrick's movies, you know, are completely different from each other. Don't, there's nothing similar about them except they're all completely different. That's the similarity. You know what I mean? They're all works of art. That is how we feel about the albums you've made. They all sound like the bands. Well, no, this is I, I, I appreciate that. I wish, I, I, I'd say, not wanting to interrupt you, but I, I, I feel compelled to anyway. Um, I would, in my lifetime, if I could do one piece of art that came even close to approximating the greatness of a Stanley Kubrick film, I would probably be able to die a happy man at that point. I think we can definitely That's agree awfully on that kind. One. That's awfully kind of you, I, but no. <laughs> but I've, I, I get the sense that you're in the studio, you're working on it, and maybe not every night, but then there's the nightly phone call of like, what went on today? What are we working on? What's going on? Let's listen to this. Let's talk about that idea. Whether that was what was happening, it seems like actually what you're doing when you're doing pre-production is just sort of bringing that element in as well. Because they're now, you're preparing it. So if they do go, this band happens to go into a studio with a, a Jim Scott kind of level, world-class engineer and makes a record, they have removed a lot of that necessity to second guess every decision they've made during the day. 
Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit bigger than just pre-production. But I, but I like the oh, idea. Of oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you suppose you're, I suppose you're right. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah I mean, because, well, when, when I really began to do pre-production work mm -hmm. in earnest, when I really got into it, I began to realize after a time that there was a developmental aspect to it. Right, sorry, you did say that, yes. Yeah, where, where, the, where, where the artist actually is moving from the place that they were at. Yeah, prior to doing this recording, even prior to the songs that they'd worked on, the songs, I guess, act as kind of like a transitional element, mm -hmm. and the collaboration between the artist and I act as a transitional element. And these are things that kind of move them in their development from that point prior to the songs that they'd written yep. to the after point where the album is done and they're at a whole different level right. in terms of their own artistic development. And I began to see that that was a very important component agree. in making any artist's record. Mm -hmm. And that has always been something that I tried to bring to any project that I would work on. Um, I have found over time, though, that being able to do that, you do need significant resources. Sure. And that's something that is not readily available in today's market as far as trying to make records, particularly rock bands. Uh, and so that kind of makes, that, that makes the equation more difficult. Now, how can we apply all these wonderful ideals that are clearly going to be very fertile territory for an artist? Like you plant that seed and that you can't even imagine what's going to come up. Yep. You know, it's harder to do. Like having the resources, you know, because they, they, there's so many facets to it. Like for me, I would always like to do things on a very grand scale on the records that I worked on. One of the reasons for that was because A, I enjoy it so much, but B, because I know that it gives something back to the artist. Like if you record drums through like subs in a very large room, for example, and the bass drum is coming out through the subs, when the drummer sits down and hits the bass drum and the whole room shakes, he's like, oh! <gasps> <laughs> you know, that's fun. That makes, the ex that makes the experience of playing drums kind of like a meta <laughs> type drum session. It's not like the normal thing anymore. It's something that's kind of hyper real for, for the drummer. And it gets everyone, it gets him excited. It gets everyone excited. And that excitement is very, it's very contagious. It, it, you know, it goes to everybody on the project. Yep. And that's the foundation for the record. And you build from there. And all of a sudden, you've got like that framework to work from. Right. It's difficult without the resources to be able to make a record that way, where you can generate that kind of enthusiasm, because the enthusiasm is also one of the things that helps people see the vision of their own record and how incredible it can be and is turning into. Without the enthusiasm, and when you, you, know, you all of a sudden start to feel like you got a job like everyone else, and you're kind of like, trying to, you know, you're like Sisyphus, <laughs> trying to pull that, you know, trying to pull that weight up, you know, mm -hmm. up, the, up the mountainside and stuff, you know, minus the lisp. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know what I'm saying? Like, sure, it, like I do. I'm making talking. a record becomes so much more difficult um, with, without those resources. So like my feeling was like this, we have to be able to apply some of this Mm -hmm. early on yep. before we get into a recording studio. And really from that perspective, it's become apparent to me that you can do a record two ways. Well, you can do a record a whole bunch of different ways, but really you can do it the way where you've got the pre-production, then you've got the production, mm -hmm. and you've got the mix. But all of a sudden, you have the element of money that's been pulled out. Mm -hmm. You know, the budget's been slashed, not by a, not by a teeny bit, but like drastically. You may yep. be getting like a tenth, if you're lucky. If you're lucky, yeah. Of what you were getting paid to make a record before. So, what are the important components in the phases of making a record at that stage? If you think about it, and this goes back to what you were saying about Rick Rubin, really, the pre-production and the mix are the two phases of making a record that you should probably be investing the most effort into. And the reason for that is, that you can, like, the, the recording is absolutely essential because you basically don't have any recorded music otherwise. 
But once you know what you're doing, you can go in with an engineer and some, and some oversight. Just a little oversight. You don't necessarily need to have a producer on hand all the time mm -hmm. to be overseeing this. I mean, if there are issues with performers, if there are performance issues, sure, there's a way to be able to interface back into the process. But a lot of people are working like this now anyhow. Sure. So why not allocate your budget to actually making the songs as good as they can possibly be? Yeah. Instead of investing a whole bunch of money into production and a whole bunch of money into mix and not do anything to make the songs better. It's sure. common sense. It's just sure. rational. Rationale. You know, then you can hire a mixer at the end who's going to make the whole thing sound really good. Makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. I want to talk to you about a song. So okay. We're gonna we're gonna wrap this up and we're gonna go over to that. So stay tuned. I think that will, that will come up. This is absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Please, as ever, leave a bunch of comments and questions below. If you've had experience um, making records with or without pre-production and you can feel the difference, whatever the discussion points, please leave it below. I would love to talk to you more about it. Thanks ever so much.